So my name is Sherry Shun. I will be doing the next talk. I'm an Oregon State University trained master gardener, and we are trained to provide information that is reliable for having been tested by research and science, relevant because it's adapted to our region, and reachable through phone, online, and also through events like this. Because we have a limited time for each presentation, I'm going to try to do it in 25 minutes, and then I will be out in the hallway to answer any questions you might have on this topic. So with that, let's get started. We're going to talk about pollinators and the Aspects that I'm going to cover are who are the common pollinators in our gardens, why should we care about them, and how, what can we do to help them. And you have a handout, and at the tail end of the handout, lots and lots of resources listed in there. Our time together is very limited. There is a lot more good stuff out there. Use them. And the resources available are from either Oregon State University Extension, the website is already in your handout, or the Xerces Society, which is at xerces.org, and their references are also listed in there. So, pollination does not always need an animal to perform. In fact, wind, rainwater, can pollinate some of the plants. However, in our gardens, we are likely to see these pollinators, and that range from birds, including hummingbird, to fly, to moth, butterfly, and bees. And just bear in mind, some of the plants have pollen that's too heavy, and they require animals to transport them. So not all plants could be pollinated by just wind and rainwater. Now among all the pollinators in the world and in our area, the most important ones are bees because they have especially adapted mouth parts, legs, and hair. So they're built to collect and transport pollen. They're simply designed differently. And all the other pollinators we've seen pictures earlier will only feed on the nectar and not collect pollen. So they can only pollinate by accident, but not by design. All right, so in this picture gallery of bees, the one in the center bottom is a honeybee, which we know about and we read about. But the rest are our native North American bees. Just some of them. There are, in fact, 4,000 species. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, literally. Now, let me just compare native against honeybee for a second. Honeybees, we know, do a lot in pollinating commercial, um, commercially grown crops. But the native bees actually do even more and they work harder because they are adapted to cold and wet climate. So they will begin working earlier in the spring, work later into the fall, and during each day they work longer hours. They're very hard working and they're just perfect for our region. And that's really another way to say let's pay special attention to our native bees. 
So the state of pollinators is not good. It's not encouraging. There has been a lot of scientific documentation of the decline of populations and diversity. In fact, there are some efforts in parts of the uh, United States to have some bumblebees listed as endangered or protected species. But we don't want to just talk about the bad news. Let's uh, take a quick look at why should we care about pollinators. I know many of us care about them for altruistic reasons. We simply like having them around. They're a part of the environment. But if you say, I want to know the practical reasons for caring about them. Well, the Xerxes Society uh, recently in their book had a statement that caught my eye. It says, on average, one out of three mouthful of American food or drink re require the service of pollinators. And here's an example of some of those food that we may like and need pollinators in order to produce, to fruit or get to seeds. Uh, I happen to like almond a lot, and I really like apples. I also like blueberries, so boy, I better really care and do my share. So one of the problems facing pollinators is habitat loss. When we take land and put up buildings and roads, farms and forests, houses and lawns, we're taking away space where pollinators could make nests and feed. Now, invasive species, uh, especially plants, is another problem. The example here is Japanese knotweed, which has an infestation problem in the state of Oregon. That map, in case you don't recognize, is the 36 counties in Oregon. And the red area is infected. Okay? So, and you look at the picture of the knotweed, well, it has flowers, so what's the problem? Well, when invasive plants take over, they become the dominant plant. So it's a form of monoculture. It reduces the diversity of native food available for the native pollinators. And um, added reason gardeners should care is most invasive plants were introduced for the home gardener's enjoyment. Mm -hmm. Pesticides is another problem facing pollinators. You might have heard about the kill of 50,000 bumblebees uh, in one location in Wilsonville last year. That's because of a direct spray of pesticides of flowering trees on which the bees were feeding. Now, pesticides don't always just directly kill. They could also, at lower dosage, weaken the pollinator's ability to navigate, to forage, to reproduce. And scientists believe a lot more kill of bees, the ones that are solitary, meaning that it's one here, one there, happen by pesticides that goes unnoticed and undocumented. So enough with the bad news and on to what can we do? How can we help? Well, pretty simple. Just with bees, we need to provide them with food because they need pollen and nectar to do well and sustain their generations. They need nesting areas, in general, warm, dry, and protected spaces. And I'll talk a little bit more about the needs of ground nesting bees versus the cavity nesting bees. And finally, give them an environment that's clean. All right, so this picture shows a garden that's doing a lot in providing pollinators. Why? Lots of flowers. See all the color, different shapes, forms. In your handout, there is a table that shows the flower color and shape and scent uh, as the best match for different groups of pollinators. But to be honest, they are pretty opportunistic. They will take pretty much what they can get. So if you say, ah, oh, that's too much work, just have lots of flowers. Have a flower-filled garden, and you'll be doing them a great service. This garden also is very open. So that allows for easy navigation, rather than flying over a lot of things overhead to try to find the food. And finally, 
it's sunny for a big part of the day. I mentioned earlier native uh, bees are more tolerant of cold and can begin working or pollinating earlier. But in general, they do need to warm up their flight muscles in order to be able to sustain the flying. So the sun helps to warm up those muscles. So all these are good things for a pollinator garden. Let's look at where they nest. This picture shows some honeybees at the entry to the cavity in the log. Can you see those bees? OK. So cavities or holes in a protected dry space is a good thing. Chances are bees will find it and put it to good use. Now you know honeybees live in colonies, and their colonies last many years. They're perennial, year after year after year. Our native bumblebees also are colonial. They live in a group, but their colony will only last one season. And I want to show you this really quickly. So where it says spring in the upper left-hand corner, new queen emerges from hibernation, comes out, finds probably an abandoned rodent nest, something, a cavity okay, that's dry, lines it, gets it ready, and then she lays her egg on a grain, of, on a ball of pollen that she collected. And here's the nectar. So she keeps collecting nectar and pollen, lay more eggs, eggs hatch. They turn into workers, they're drones. So they're all her daughter. And the daughters will go out and forage and help care for the young. And the queen keeps laying eggs. And so there will be generations of workers hatching, adding to the population. So the colony will expand and grow through the summer and then the last generation toward the end of the season will be not workers anymore, but the new queen and male. New queen will eat and grow, and when she's ready, fly out, mate, and then look for a place to hibernate for the winter. If all goes well, the cycle continues. But all is not well. If the nest is disturbed in the middle of the season, the colony will collapse and never reach the stage of reproduction because remember the new queen and males come out only as the last generation. If they don't get enough food in the season, same thing, they will not perpetuate. So if you want to help bumblebees, think of planting flowers that bloom late season, late summer into fall. And that will provide the food to sustain the bumblebees. However, 90% of the bees in North America, the, the species, are solitary. What does that mean? Well, they live by themselves. 90% of the species are solitary. And we tend not to notice them because they're nesting in the ground, bare dirt with those little holes, and you're looking and saying, I thought those are anthills or something else. Chances are it's a solitary bee. The female dug the tunnel underground. And here is a solitary bee arriving at the entry to her nest in a patch of bad lawn. There are values to those bad lawn. Because of the bare exposed dirt, here's the hole to her underground tunnel. And see all this yellow stuff here? Those are pollen collected and carried by her hind legs that are especially adapted with hair to carry the pollen. Do they make a little bump? And um, uh, you can see a kind of a little mound of soil here that she had dug up and displaced. And this is a female mason bee, and she is just sealing. Uh, looks like a bamboo, mm -hmm. a stem of bamboo, because it's hollow in the center. Okay? And as she lays her eggs, she puts up a mud wall. And this is the mud wall to seal and protect the eggs. So what do bees need if we want to provide them with nesting locations? Well, we can leave snacks alone. 
if you can do it. Or just leave part of it instead of the whole thing if that seems unsightly. Because old snacks with cavities really help provide nesting locations. We can build small brush piles and rock piles because the crevices and the gaps in between provides opportunities for nesting. Um, we can have some parts of the garden that's not fully planted and covered with vegetation because they need access to bare dirt. So it cannot be unplanted area with three inches of mulch. They don't have the ability to dig through that mulch. All right? and, um, and we can provide nesting materials, uh, mason bee boxes, uh, bumblebee boxes, etc. So you think, oh, I don't want a garden that has all these bare dirt. It'll look ugly. Well, this garden has quite a bit of bare dirt. And uh, it also has places where, um, sorry, where there are clumps of grass that does not run together. So actually under the grass, a tussock of grass is another potential nesting location because it's protected. So I just want to give you some examples of ways that you might be able to make a garden look good and provide for some nesting places for native solitary bees. Butterflies, let's touch on them quickly. The adults do feed on pollen and nectar, so flowers, lots of flowers. But the larvae eat host plants. In fact, the host plants are places where the adults will lay her eggs and when the youngster hatch, food is right there. And they also need a, 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 an environment that's clean. So painted ladies are pretty common in our area. And as with most butterflies, they like a flower that has a wide landing pad, kind of an open form that allow them to forage easily. But with the painted lady, their host plants could include thistle, mallow, lupin, potato. Interesting, huh? And uh, the spring azure, not a particularly attractive plant, uh, 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 butterfly, but it's more abundant. And it may have to do with the fact that it's willing to take a wide range of plants as host plant. It's not that picky. Okay, so at this point you think, Gosh, if I want to help butterflies, I have to find out what each one will use as host plants, what each one like as flowers. That's too complicated. Well, the simple solution is plant native shrubs and trees. Because native shrubs and trees are used by many butterflies and moths as host plants. So let's review all the things we've talked about. We know pollinators need our help. We know native bees deserve our attention because they work much harder and they do so much that usually is unnoticed. Um, we know offering flowering plants for pollinators will sustain their food supply. And they have different requirements for nesting areas, bees and butterflies. And finally, it's best to reduce presence of pesticides. So, planting flowers. I'm a gardener, love flowers. If we're doing flowers with pollinators in mind, think variety in color, shape of flowers, and size. Because bees, butterflies, hummingbirds all have different favorites. If we have variety, we increase our chance of serving more of them. Think long season of bloom, early spring into late fall. Remember late fall to help bumblebees especially. Early spring for the early emerging bees like mason bees, for example. Remember the natives come out earlier. And think the rule of three. If it's too much in thinking what flowering plants to include, use the rule of three bloomers each season. Three in the spring, three in the summer, three in the fall. As a way to adjust your plant palette. And finally, the recommendation of ideal size of flowers is a three foot diameter. That's big. I probably cannot do that. But the idea is you don't want to make the pollinators work so hard 
fly here to find a little thing, get a little bit of food, fly another distance to get another one. The less energy they have to spend in getting food allows them to have more energy to put into reproduction to help sustain the colony. And think about leaving snacks, brush piles, um, things that may not be as tidy in the garden as nests for our native bees. And this picture shows there are ways to make it look kind of artistic. And you can also use human-made nest boxes like the picture up there. And the Xerxes Society website has all kinds of information about other nesting uh, structures for native bees. Oh, and bear dirt. Hard to do, but think about areas that's dry, protected, and leave some patches free and watch it for a season to see what happens. If it works, maybe that bit of bare dirt is worth the sacrifice of not having yet another flower. And plant native shrubs because they serve so many butterflies. And um, we know the monarchs like milkweeds, they're picky. But most of our butterflies are not nearly as picky. So we, it's easy to help them. So integrated pest management is my last message. This whole philosophy in gardening is first figure out what the problem is before applying any solution. So if we figure out the problem, then we would consider the low impact methods first. And what might they be? Hand removal. Uh, you use water jet to spray off things that we don't like. Pruning to remove the infested parts if that's feasible. And consider alternatives. If the plant that you really love is just not worth the trouble, maybe it's time to take it out and put in something else that's better adapted. Only use pesticides as a last resort when it's necessary. And be sure to read those little fine prints on the label because when it's not used properly, it's not going to probably do what it's intended to do. So with all of these together, I think we gardeners can change the world for pollinators. Thank you very much.